Well, they're letting me drive a boat. It's probably not safe. But since it's Australia, no one cares. You do whatever you want. Alright, thanks for coming back to the Barbell Medicine YouTube channel or iTunes station, wherever you're getting this at. This next Q&A comes from Sydney, Australia, where Tom Campitelli and I traveled to uh, February of 2018. We did a few Barbell Medicine camps there, and this is the question and answer that follows. Now, I do want to apologize in advance. So again, we're traveling. We're in a noisy gym. It was very warm, so the doors were open. So I tried to do the best I could with the audio. It is pretty good. I was using a Rode mic attached to my cell phone, so it's pretty good. There are some clicking here and there that I tried to get rid of uh, but overall I just want to apologize in advance for any audio issues that may pop up that I didn't catch this thing's almost an hour long and I did go through it minute by minute but there might have been some stuff that I missed so I apologize for that hope you guys enjoy uh, so the first one is um, because the reason why I do my lifting is so um, have fallen getting ourselves the second line is I want to gain like uh, more mental strength so how so when you're actually doing it, when you go, uh, how can you actually maximize the benefits to gain mental strength when you're winning? In fact, you don't need to separately train your mental strength. Uh, the very act of weightlifting, the very fact of doing something challenging and then coming back and doing something slightly more challenging will have the knock-on effect of helping you to develop the fearlessness or the kind of, I mean, there's some aggression that actually goes into lifting a heavy weight. And you'll see this as people go along. I mean, they, you don't want to uh, kind of become overly histrionic and overly dramatic, but as you, the act of doing this, is actually what helps to train you both physically and mentally. Yeah, uh, it's get, getting, overcoming a hardship, doing something that's difficult, and then proving to yourself that you can do it and you survive and you're a capable human. I mean, that's the whole process by which you become, you know, mentally strong, quote unquote, through this. So going to the gym on a regular basis, training, adding weight to the bar, um, figuring out how to fix things when they go wrong. These are all empower you as a human. Um, and I, I think that as you become more and more well trained, you know, uh, you'll you'll become you'll notice that you've just become a slightly different person, uh, magnifying the great the great parts of yourself. Um, but think about it like this: so the first time you ever trained under a bar, right? It's pretty intimidating because you're like, I don't know what I'm doing, I don't know what, how much weight to put on the bar, how many rep, like I don't even know it, I don't know anything about anything, and this is intimidating, particularly if you're at a Commercial gym, where there's a lot of other people who seemingly know what they're doing, although now, looking back, you're probably like, they also don't, <laughs> don't know what they're doing. But now that you have a plan in place, you know the, your trajectory, you're empowered, right? So that's uh, it's a cool, cool thing to see. And a year from now, you're going to be a badass, and uh, you know, it's awesome. So, and the really cool thing, and particularly for the female aspect of this, is the more people like you there are, the better because then other people say oh there's more of we can, I can do that too or you know so that's really cool for me to see you know where our our brand and any just the fitness industry in general is mostly male you know I mean and then our, our brand or most of our business is male and so when people ask me you know what are your goals for your business or what are your goals for your brand is I want more female participation I want more female coaches I want more female you know uh, uh, presence in the strength and conditioning field saying, hey, not, you don't have to necessarily be a power, competitive power lifter, Olympic lifter, or figure athlete, or bodybuilder. You don't have to be a fitness influencer to be a female who strength trains. You just have to be a female who wants to, you know, be healthy and strong, and you can do it too. And I think that's the most powerful uh, thing. So That's just good. Yeah. Um, Warm-ups. So I know you obviously did a progression of Say squats, you warm up in the squat. Do you recommend any other sort of general warm up before that? No. It, you know, so you'd have to make a case that um, whatever else you're going to do that is not the movement 
contributes a significant benefit to your training performance that day or training performance long term, yep. that is in excess of just squatting. Does that make sense? If we're talking about the squat or the press or, or whatever the movement is. And I haven't found anything like that that isn't actually training. See what I'm saying? So like things that would benefit your I wonder what they're doing. Things that would benefit your... Uh, Learning to drive. Right. Things that would benefit your squat are squatting, deadlifting, other variations. I don't know of a stretch that would benefit your squat that's not a squat. Well, that's a... Well, so activation is a whole other level of bullshittery that needs to die a fiery death. It's... Uh, so let glute, glute fire. Your glutes aren't firing. Your glutes have amnesia. They, they have Parkinson's also. So they, you know, <laughs> it's a pill rolling tremor of your butt. No, um, it is a lack of understanding of the musculoskeletal system and how it works. Your glutes are firing if you're extending your hip. It is not possible for you to extend your hip without glute function. So unless you had a gunshot wound, stab wound, got kicked by a kangaroo and severed your inferior gluteal nerve and now your glute maximus is no longer firing because you've had a nerve denervation, guess what's firing? Your glutes. Now you, may, you might not, your central nervous system may not be fully primed to maximally perform prior to a warm-up, which is why we warm up and don't just come in the, to the gym, load your work sets and do it. That's the function of the warm-up, is to get you prepared from a neuromuscular standpoint to perform. You know, there are structural changes that occur at the level of the muscle with a warm-up. So the muscles heat up, the viscosity decreases, your tem uh, temporal and spatial motor unit firing all optimize, so you're able to perform. But you don't need to do glute bridges or, like, you know, screw around with, like, monster walks or, you know, any of that other stuff. It's just a waste of time. It's nonspecific. The only time, again, that you would use those things is if you had somebody who was so afraid of squatting or deadlifting, right? Like, they literally would not do it. You couldn't do it, you know? They were afraid of getting hurt or pain. And you did those other things, and that made them less afraid, so subsequently they would actually squat and deadlift. Then that's a, that's, you can use that, but the idea would be to remove that over time. Because why are you doing it? You want, to, you want to squat the, for the day? Start with the bar. Or start with the bodyweight squat, then go to the bar. And keep doing the bar for empty bar sets until you're ready to add weight. Plus, you don't have to be on the floor. You don't have to carry a bunch of weird stuff in your bag. I, you know, I dated a girl once who had a vibrating foam roller. And once I found that, we, it was, we had a discussion. And, uh, we haven't talked since then. But it's just, you know, I, I, it was a weird thing. And so I, you don't need that in your life. You will, you will note that you will note that we did not do anything besides squatting today, and you will also note that your performance was not impaired. But maybe it improved. Yeah. yeah. I used to I used to do a whole bunch of warming up, waving arms and legs around before I squatted, and I found it was actually irritating my hip. And when I stopped doing it, my hips my hip stopped hurting, and my performance was not negatively impacted. Gently warm up. Add some weight, keep going, and yeah. allow, allow yourself to just warm up. An interesting thing, so uh, CrossFitters. How many people here work, train at CrossFit Gym? Nobody? Oh, it's much more common in the States. People like train at CrossFit Gym, but they'll just do their own thing. CrossFitters notoriously warm up with all sorts of weird stuff because there are many people with authority or prominence within that genre that are advocating uh, very strange, like, non-specific warm-ups which I find a complete and utter use of a waste of time if you're a CrossFitter. Think about it, if you're a competitive CrossFitter, you desire to be much better at CrossFit. There's so many things you need to be good at, right? You need to be good at general conditioning, like running, rowing, assault bike stuff. You need to be great at gymnastics. You need to be good at other skills, double unders, right, would be, be, be one. Um, and then you also need to be strong. You have a lot of time that you, like, need to spend training, and you're going to spend 30 minutes doing ROMWAD or, like, foam rolling and all this other nonspecific stuff. So what I found during that time, this is a, uh, 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 something I agree with a couple other coaches who are prominent in the CrossFit community, is that your warm-up may be a skill-based thing in that instance. So you come in the gym, and maybe you're doing a 10-minute uh, EMOM, so every minute on the minute where you're doing 
10 double unders and then 10 wall balls. It's just a like low intensity sort of skill work to get you better and more efficient at those movements. And that's if you were a mixed a multi, you know, modal athlete like a crossfitter. For strength training, I would just squat or deadlift, whatever you're doing first. It's a, so, and the final thing I'll say, and then we'll move on. <laughs> That's my argument for what to do with the first thing you come to the gym. What's your second lift of the day? If it's press or bench, you don't spend much time warming up for that, right? Because you just get to the bar. Yeah, I don't think you need to do a specific warm up, you know, that, that has, is not the exercise. So I say, done starting strength or strongly focused on whatever, and you get into that stage where your incremental stuff is plateau, you want to move on and move to an intermediate sort of lifting program. What would you guys recommend if you're not, if you're self caged or you're out there? Yeah, well, Tom? Texas method. Oh, God, come on, Tom. <laughs> Don't do me like that. <laughs> Wait, no, my you're gonna, You're going to need. Uh, Obviously, an increase in complexity, uh, and that's probably via loading and exercise selection, and you're going to need an increase in stress. Well, yeah, the, the stress is the main thing. So increase in, in loading, right, could theoretically increase the stress, and increase in exercise or diff, uh, variance in exercise selection may alter the stress profile of a given workout, but ultimately, the stress needs to increase from novice to intermediate because... Once you're making this transition, you have identified yourself as a person that needs more stress because the existing amount of stress isn't producing a performance improvement. So you could do Texas method, th theoretically, if you were of the opinion that it in increased the amount of stress that you were applying to yourself compared to the novice in your progression. I am of the opinion that it does not. I am of the opinion that Texas method is a reduction in stress, allowing previously developed strength to be displayed unless the Texas method is modified significantly such that the stress being applied to the individual is greater than it was before. So that being said, there are multiple different ways to program this. So to answer your question, I need to know more about what you want to do. Do you want to be as strong as humanly possible? Do you have other things that are compromising this in that you have certain conditioning goals, body composition goals? That all depends. In general, it has to be more stress. In general, the variation and complexity of the training is going to increase, okay, and you get more time to experiment. But the one thing that cannot be changed is the increase in stress. So my bias for a person who just wants to get generally stronger after the novice linear progression is to do the bridge. That's why we wrote this free ebook with the program, it's downloadable, barbellmedicine.com website. We also have a bunch of other training templates that are available for either free or for purchase, depending on if you have way different goals. But again, the take home is that stress has to increase. A reduction in stress produces regression long term. And uh, that's what I view Texas method proper. If we agree that, well, look, Tom. No, I'm giving you a hard time. So your, but your version of the Texas method is different. Slightly. Although, if you were to look at how I program the Texas method, it's not. It's not wildly different. Well, I uh, didn't say wildly. Yeah. Um, uh, for most of the people that I do the Texas method with, they are in many cases going towards powerlifting. So, whereas the Texas method, one of the real um, complaints about the Texas method is what happens with the pressing and bench pressing variants. You don't get enough exposure to them. Well, yes. Yeah. yeah. And so, for a powerlifting variant, I don't have you vary pressing one week and benching the next. I have you bench press twice a week and press in the middle, and then I may have you do some pressing after your bench pressing on the Friday. And you know how you, how you rotate through with the squats and such, I also vary a little bit based on what the kind of canonical Texas method is. And same, with, same, with, same with pulling, I have people do light deadlifts in there. So deadlifting volume goes up, squatting volume goes up, bench pressing volume goes up, and so Jordan is, Jordan is correct. My version of the Texas method actually increases volume and increases frequency of the stuff that you're trying to do. Yeah. Uh, so you can, when Jordan, when Jordan says Texas method doesn't work, he's talking like more generally as it's laid out. Uh, there are many ways of 
dicing up the Texas yeah. method, of which you have, I mean, you have, have an, an article, article that's, what is it, like 10 ways to skin the Texas method or something totally, like that? Yeah, just yeah. different variations. So, yeah. you know. the, 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 well, something more germane to this discussion is we're talking about stress, right? So if I asked you guys, gals, what is more stressful on an individual? A 300, uh, sorry, we'll use kilos, a 140 kilo squat for three sets of five or 145 for three sets of five? Which one's more stressful? Nope, we don't know. I can sucker you. You answer. That. So the, don't, I'm not a jerk. Well, I am, but you are. Yeah. The so no, because we don't know. It depends, right? If on the day that you squatted 140 for three sets of five, it was like super easy. You could have done 150, and on the day you squat 145, it was a grinder. Which you know. Well, it's just like if it's, if it's the same person who's at the same level, of course, and probably their max is 150, say, then the 145 is obviously. But their max is changing, right? So we just don't know. There are other inputs that tell you the, how hard the thing was, and therefore how stressful. It was. Actually, your your example would be yeah, better, the would be better if the one forty, like let's say yeah. you squatted one forty and it practically killed you, yeah. And then you came back and you squatted one forty five, and you feel like you could have done extra reps every set, yeah. Then arguably the lighter weight, which was qualitatively harder. Actually, was more stressful. Yeah. So you could, you could, and if you wanted to further like make this comparison, you could have these things be a month apart, yep. right? You could have somebody squat 140 for three sets of five, and it practically crushes them, and then a month later they squat 145 for three sets of five, and they and it, they crush it. Like the stress uh, of 140 could have been greater, and that it you know was actually it was more a stressful. Weight. Yeah. Even though, even though, like the if you were to do tonnage, you know, the total tonnage is greater. So there, to Jordan's point, it's uh, it's nuanced. There's something there's something besides just the weight meme. on the bar. Although, you know, as a, as a general proxy for most people, putting a little bit more weight on the bar is both a demonstration of more strength as well as an increased training stress, provided that other things are largely equal. Yeah, it's just a after the novice progression stops working, your stress is not limited to one training session. You're doing multiple training sessions to accrue stress. So it is, it's more important to consider the totality of the program, right? So the one session doesn't matter. It's just, a you know, you're trying to contribute to total accumulated stress. So you don't want something that's knock down, drag out, you know, 10 on 10, 10 out of 10, bone on bone, uh, heavy, because that's preventing you from training productively going forward. Yeah, even if the weight's actually lighter. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, the the one thing I talk about, you know, people people say, oh, so uh, all, you know, just more stress is better. Well, well, no, the correct amount of stress and the correct type of stress is better. So if I light you on fire, that's a lot of stress, Right, but it's not going to help you get stronger, right? So that's that's the that's the uh, big thing with programming. I mean, stress management, fatigue management. All right, we, we went. Should keep going. What? You yeah. should keep going. Yeah, all right. <laughs> um, you mentioned uh, Go Man earlier in the day. Yeah. Um, what specifics for that? Is that for a younger person, an old person? When do you stop? Sure. Go mad, go mad parameters. So if you are a young male who's underweight uh, and who needs to rapidly gain body weight, you could use the gallon of milk a day or 3.76 liters of milk per day in order to be an easy, relatively inexpensive, portable source of calories. It's like 2,800 calories, I think, in a, a non-skim milk variation. Um, that being said, you could eat the same amount of calories without milk. There's nothing special about milk compared to an omnivorous diet. There's a high leucine and branched chain amino acid and protein content within milk, but if you're eating animal products, there's nothing you know super special about milk. There's also nothing wrong with milk if you if you like it. Uh, if you are female, period. If you are uh, overweight, if you're not underweight, if you have some evidence of cardiometabolic disease, so high blood pressure, your cholesterol is elevated, you have diabetes, any incidence of insulin resistance, your waist circumference is 
uh, you know, up well above uh, normal, which is 40 inches for male, 37 for female, you are not a candidate for GOMAD. You're probably also not a candidate for weight gain in general at that point, just because you have other things that are complicating your health picture that would better be served by losing weight, regardless of other, other outcomes. So for you, you're 30 years old, you said? And you weigh, what, 80? 82? 80? You could gain weight, but you don't need to do GOMAD to do it. You could use GOMAD. The thing would be if you're gaining a bunch of weight and your waist size is blowing up, you know, faster than your lifts are blowing up, well, that's not a fair trade-off, right? So I'm more moderate on my approach for a person like you than if you were like 19 and weighed 70. If you weighed 19 or 70, I'd say drink all the milk, bathe in it, you know, like start an IV and to just put it in the IV. Um, but for you, I would just be in a caloric surplus so that you're gaining weight and you would be weighing yourself regularly, watching your weight go up. And if it's not going up, what do you have to do? You have to add more calories. So when people say, I'm eating all this food and I'm not gaining weight, what's the deal? I'm like, well, you either have some sort of tropical disease, right? You know, you have celiac sprue, you have uh, Whipple's <laughs> infection, you have, uh, you know, some, something that's some rare metabolic disorder, right? Or you're bad at math. Well, could be either, you know. Um, yeah, so if you're not gaining weight, you're in a caloric, you do maintenance. Uh, and if you're losing weight, you're at a deficit. And if you're not losing weight, you're at maintenance, you know, by definition. So if you're not losing weight and you want to lose weight, what do you have to do? Eat less, right? That's it. Also, That's for people that are interested in actually using milk, you don't have to go from zero to a gallon. Yeah, that's it. You can, I was, how, what is six foot two in centimeters? Is it 188? I don't know, I'll speak centimeters, bro. Something like that. I'm, I'm approximately 188 centimeters. And I weighed 172 pounds, which I 70 think, kilos, no, which is 80 kilos. -ish. I think it was like a little 78 ish, maybe. I, I'm doing that off the top of my head. People who know metric don't kill me. Uh, so I was fairly underweight, uh, and I started drinking a cup of milk after every meal. And then as I needed more, I added more. Yeah. So You're just I titrated up. I titrated up over the course of about four weeks, and then I was only drinking a gallon of milk for like a couple of weeks um, and then that's all that's all that was needed uh, and then I had a little bit of a training layoff and then I went back at it again uh, and so the amount of time that you're fully consuming a gallon of milk if it is appropriate for you is often not that long and it can it's like anything else if you need a couple extra calories what's a cup of milk like calorie wise it's not that much, but it's an easy way to probably get, you know, 100 calories or whatever it is. Yep. Uh, no, it won't make you fat. No, it won't increase your estrogen levels. No, it won't do any other weird thing to you that's not been based in evidence. So it's just people saying weird stuff for the sake of saying weird stuff. I don't understand. I don't understand what, what, what would motivate somebody to do that unless they own, like, stock in, like, a soy milk company or something. And I was, I was 31 at the time. Last year? No. If only I was 31 last year. Now I'm 40. Yeah, yeah. You know, that white though. I survived. Yeah. Um, I guess I'll ask something about um, like working around injury, um, maybe tendonitis or something. I um, had to play around with my squat grip a fair bit because um, it was uh, affecting my bench. I couldn't bench for a while. Um, the only way I could re it really got better was stopping everything for about five weeks. Um, finally started loading the bench up slowly and got better, but um, is there any other way to train around injury like that, whether it be tendonitis or... Yeah, I mean, well, each injury is going to be, yeah, each injury is going to be different, right? Like, you hit by a car, is going to be different than, you know, you have just a, a wrist tendonitis thing. So, the my general management is make sure, initially make sure that there are no red flag symptoms. So, red flag symptoms are are going to vary depending on the injury, but that would be things like, oh, I can't walk, or, oh, this thing's huge and red and swollen and angry, or, you know, I have numbness tingling somewhere. That would require, like, immediate sort of professional evaluation, doctor, uh, typically, and then they would refer appropriately, okay? So, you don't, lack of any red flag symptoms, depending on, again, it's very broad, then you make sure there's no uh, grotesque technique issue that is contributing. And sometimes you won't find anything. Sometimes you will, you know, another, and sometimes 
you'll fix something, fix something, and it'll placebo you into feeling better. So again, that seems reasonable to check technique out. Then if that still doesn't work, or you don't find anything. Then you're trying to find a movement that you're not afraid of that is in a similar sort of group. So for instance, a squat, you would say the low bar back squat, the high bar back squat, the front squat, the safety squat bar squat, the leg press, the, you know, and you go down, down the line, um, are all similar. And you start with what's the most similar, and then you keep moving back until you find something that allows you to train. That's kind of how, how I would do that. Um, rarely, rarely, in non-operative situations do I find that pure rest is the best management. Sometimes you're, that hand is forced if you either cannot find a variation that works or you don't have access to that variation, right? So let's say the leg press was the only thing that somebody could tolerate the lower limb issue, but they had, had no access to a leg press. They couldn't set up a belt squat. They couldn't, you know, well, what are you going to do? You know, maybe at that point you're deadlifting more per week if you can tolerate deadlifting. So and again, you're just trying to figure out something that fits in. That's, uh, that's the management. Uh, so I had this butt thing. It was going on for like 20 weeks, right? I like, I don't know what was going on. I couldn't back squat at all. Uh, Leah came to my house to train once in Virginia, and I uh, had like 160 on the bar. It's like supposed to be a warm up, right? And I squatted once, and involuntary tears came out of my eyes because it hurt so bad. And she goes, What are you doing? And I was like, I'm squatting. It's fine. It's totally fine. <laughs> But anyway, so I found out through this sort of process that I could, like, for instance, I could front squat to just a parallel, and I could rack pull the bar below my knees, but I couldn't pull from the floor at that time, and I couldn't back squat. But I just and I worked those down, and three or four weeks later, I was able to, yeah, pull and squat normally. So that that's my general management: no reflex symptoms, make sure for, form is good, and then variation if needed. Yeah. Also, support. Oh shoot! Last thing. Sorry. Tom's like. Hey, you're the you're the one who wants to move quickly. I'm here, I'm here to chat. Uh, sometimes supportive gear can be super super useful, uh, both from like a placebo standpoint and then also just from like a, a unloading standpoint. So, for instance, I was saying we were talking about belts earlier, right? So, if you have somebody with a back injury, or you have a back injury, and you previously would only wear a belt on your heavy sets, wear it on all sets, every set. Uh, it's not providing, it's not a crutch. It, all it's doing is allowing you to contract your musculature of your trunk a little harder, and then also making you believe that you have some support. Right, so let maybe allow you to train around back injury. If elbow sleeves make your elbows feel better and you can train, do that. If knee wraps, for instance, make your knees feel a whole lot better and you can train your squat more productively and get around knee pain, use that. Uh, I know people who've had hip replacements or have you know other wonky things with hips using briefs, powerlifting briefs, and you know everything in this in this entire building is a crutch, okay, that allows us to train more efficiently. And I think you including the roof. That's what I'm saying. Including yeah. Roof, running water, barbell, plates, shoes, like, yeah. The food that you didn't have to go out and like kill some, you know, and prepare yourself. So yeah, where do you draw the line? Well, I think again, anything that makes a substantial difference in your quality of life, training and training outcomes, which is obviously important to everyone here because you guys paid a substantial you know, amount of money to come see us. I don't have I'm not held to any standard to what I can and can't allow to make somebody train more productively. To answer your question. Yeah, it does, yeah. Thank you. Uh, do you have any recommendations on how to think about setting goals? Is it consistency? Is it targeting a specific weight or attending a, a meet? If you, I mean, goals are obviously going to be based upon your personal desires, right? So I can't tell you what it is that you enjoy. However, if you have been training for a while and you're struggling with motivation, but you still want to continue to lift weights, then some kind of a competition is a wonderful external marker that will encourage you to train and encourage you to push much harder. Literally entering into a meet will make each training session more meaningful because you want to perform on the platform. So in that sense, competitions are wonderful. Um, as far as goal setting, like figuring out what it is you want to do, I don't have any general recommendations on that besides actually you figuring out what it is that you enjoy the most. What's the most intrinsically valuable thing for you and that what you want to work towards? And, you know, it can be 
one, one drawback of barbell training is it can be a solitary kind of thing to do. Uh, you go to a gym, and sometimes there's people there, sometimes there's not, but it's not like it's being done in a class. But uh, yes, a competition is a wonderful thing. Uh, and it can be powerlifting, it can be Olympic lifting, it could be strongman, it could be running a 5K, you know, whatever, whatever it is that you want to do. Um, Competitions are good, and they'll probably be an important component of your training as an intermediate. Yeah. yeah. Hell, you, you can you can enter a meet even as a novice. It's not like you. No one no one has any idea what you uh, lifted at meet. No one pays any attention besides yeah, you. Yeah. No one cares. It's true. No one cares. Yeah. Except for it's, you. It's just fun. But it is. It makes it real. It makes it meaningful. So. That's that's the only thing is that any goal that you should have should make what you're doing, the process that you're going through, the hardship that you're going through, meaningful, right? So you want to learn to play an instrument. Well, well, why? Right? There has to be some goal associated that makes the hard, you know, the hard part meaningful. Just doing something hard for the sake of doing something hard is a really good way to like burn yourself out. You know, people can suffer, can can tolerate innumerable suffering. For a meaningful goal, right? The more meaningful it is, the more you can, the more you can suffer. But I found that if the goal is not personally meaningful to me, I can't, make, I can't make myself stick with it. There's no, there's no incentive that's big enough. I suppose have you ever had an overweight trainee where the strength gets to a point where they have to choose between eating more to get stronger or putting the strength on hold to lose more body fat? Um, me? No. And because I want to dissociate strength acquisition and body weight acquisition, certainly if you're underweight and minimal, your muscle cross-sectional area is not very great, it's going to be difficult to gain, to acquire strength without also gaining tissue, right? You need more muscle mass. But a person who has significant amount of muscle cross-sectional area and a, some extra body fat, they can keep getting stronger while losing weight. If the calorie deficit is so significant that they are super, super fatigued, so we're talking about 500, 600, 700 calories a day, not the deficit, but like the total energy in intake, well, sure, that's a different situation. But if we're talking about a small calorie deficit, which is what I advise for people who are trying to lose weight over a long period of time while getting stronger, then really what you're saying is your programming variables need to change. If you are in a calorie deficit, you're not gaining significant amount of muscle mass while you're training. You are less sensitive to the training intervention, meaning that you're going to need more training to get a smaller result than if you were going to allow yourself to gain muscle tissue. But you're willing to make that compromise because you also want to lose body fat at the same time. So it's not an either-or situation. The either-or situation would be much more uh, or it'd be more black and white if a person was very underweight, right? Or in a, you know, was hemorrhaging weight because they were on like a five or 600 calorie a day diet, which some people have done. Since they, they look they're like, hey, I'm going to commit the next three months of my life to just losing weight and that's it. And they go five or 600 calories a day. Yeah. And so your, what your gestalt is that they do worse long term than those who lose weight slowly. I don't know what that would be. But a lot of people would say that. Yeah. Not the case. People do things for different reasons, and you know, again, if that motivation that to suffer through that is, is high, then they do just fine. There's a guy who fasted for like oh, it's like 18 or 19 months who lost you know 400 pounds or some change, and some change that's in the medical literature. You supplement it with BCAAs, essential fatty acids, and vitamins, you know, medically. Uh, but yeah, he fasted. So that's my favorite troll answer when people say, "What's the fastest way to lose weight?" Like, don't eat. So he was. What, consuming 100 calories a day or Maybe. less? Yeah, energy from vitamins and BCAAs and fish oil, basically. And don't do that at home. Uh, but yeah, we, so what's the fastest way, way to lose weight? We just don't eat. Cease to eat. Yeah, get punched in the face, break your jaw in a couple spot, spots, you wire should, it up. You should eat more. To, yes. <laughs> Sorry, don't, don't. Well. <laughs> <laughs> World hunger is not real. <laughs> Yeah, no, you didn't know that? If you just don't eat, you know, at some point you're not eating enough to lose weight. Right. World right. hunger is not real. Exactly. Like there are starving. They need to eat less they need to, to start putting on weight. That's right. Yeah. yeah, you just take those starving kids and you tell them to eat less and then they'll gain weight. Yeah. I like that. Would people say this? Do they like, like, how? I don't know. All right.
We'll move on. I'm going to my blood pressure is high right now. Do you guys have any rules of thumb around deload weights? What's the deal? So if uh, an intermediate, for instance, is training for a period of time with increasing stress, sure. would you have a point in which you'd say we need to have a deload weight where we reduce the stress or would you plan that in or would it be like individual? Would you do it as a reaction to um, you know, somebody's inability to adapt? Yeah. yeah. So, so I think there's a difference between a deload week and like a pivot week or transition week or something like that. So transition or pivot week, I think it's like a washout period. So basically you're doing training and you're adapting well as evidenced by the fact that you can, whatever you're tracking for your progress, your three sets of five or your estimated one rep max or something is increasing at regular intervals, right? So things are going well until it's not. And when it's not, you're saying, oh, I'm no longer responding to this level training to the stress. So you need a washout period, a transition period, where you apply a different kind of stress, which may be overall, it's, di it's different. It may be less total stress, but the main thing is that it's different so that you're resensitizing yourself to that type of training. It may be followed by a similar period of training. It may be followed by a peaking phase. It may be, you know, but yeah, that's a transition period. A deload week is something I use more when I'm getting ready for a meet. So it's like you've done a ton of training, everything's you know going well, and it's the week before the meet or a few days before the meet, and then you're markedly reducing stress so that you dissipate a ton of fatigue, such that you can perform well. Now, the period that when you're reducing all this fatigue, you're reducing all the stress. You're also losing the ability to tolerate stress and fatigue. You've, you're detraining effectively, right? Um, so, but that's a trade-off you're willing to get. Interestingly, I had a guy go to a meet. He was uh, like advanced or, or late intermediate advanced guy. He totaled uh, right around 680 kilos this meet. As a, as a pretty pretty strong guy. All right, and we had him. He had like a week and a half deload prior to this meet. And then at the end, after the meet, I was like, you know, let's just go on back on LP, like linear progression proper. Right now, granted, this guy had a high motivation to train. He was actively gaining weight. And, you know, his technique was great. He ran an LP for about seven weeks after that. And then I did a mini deload and tested again. He added 300 pounds to his total in a short period of time. But effectively what that showed to me, and then I've subsequently tested this a uh, number of times, you can resensitize somebody to a training stress by having this washout period. So imagine you have a person on novice linear progression, starting strength novice linear progression, and they stall. And then you deload them. Take 10% off all the weights, you back them up. That's a deload, that's a washout period, you know? So that's, or sorry, that, that's more of a, 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 a deload week than a, than a washout period. And then they're able to kind of go back up. They've resensitized themselves to that training stress. And that'll work a few times until it stops. Yeah. We're just writing this book, this programming book, as we keep answering these questions and flesh this out. Tom keeps trolling me. I'll say something, he goes, mm -hmm. But what about? Or what I'll say is that's a novel idea, <laughs> and you need to you need to expand on that. That's a very important uh, insight. Uh, no one cares about exercise. They care about boot, like booty shots, mm -hmm. Instagram. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, sorry, two times over. Um, yeah. Yeah. So if the protein, say I'm doing protein shake, and it's got like. Just over three grams of leucine. Sure. Just like, yeah, three grams of leucine per serve. That's I don't have to take any more BCA supplements. You do not need additional BCAs. Yes. Most proteinaceous sources that come from animal at a about a twenty gram serving size will contain enough essential amino acids, which includes branch chain amino acids, to maximize muscle protein synthesis unless you're old. Uh, old. Define, define old. Well, yeah, great question. How do you define shoulder width? Like, it's just, this is kind of a gray zone, but this is, a, the continuum is like this. So protein sensitivity, amino acid sensitivity goes like this. The older you get, the more aged, okay? The more female you become, the more vegan you become, all right? The, and the less trained you are, the less sensitive you are to protein. 
That's just in general. And uh, that beats, so if you're, let's say that you're 30 right now, and at age 60, you're going to be less protein sensitive, and you'll need more protein to get the same effect. So I still wouldn't add BCAAs, probably. I would just eat more protein at that point. BCAAs, I'm at, I'm at, a, I'm at an impasse here. I, I'm, I'm, I'm of a mind to just take them out of my supplement. I think that it's difficult to suggest that they are ineffective completely because there's some evidence that they reduce fatigue or prevent fatigue and people will tend to hydrate better with them and tend to have better cognitive performance uh, or, or be more alert during training. Like there's some evidence there, but there's also evidence that it doesn't really, they don't really do much outside of placebo, but then they're pretty cheap and harmless. And so you're like, oh, what do I do? So I don't know. I don't have a good answer for that yet. I think that if you're going to take BCAAs, the best time to take them would be before and after a workout with all the rest of your supplements. Otherwise, I would only take them if you were a had a, a medical condition where you couldn't take in a lot of protein. That would be my, my thing. All right. Jane? Uh, oh, um, I just wanted to know how important you think is, apart from lifting weights, in the second where you, you do lifting, about conditioning and um, do, do you do much of it yourself and what's, um, is there some kind of hierarchical thing with conditioning like for instance is the prowler the king of conditioning or what would you recommend? Being strong is probably more a more important thing for longevity as shown through research, like when you look at, when people correct for cardiorespiratory endurance, it has less of an effect on longevity than do things like your grip strength or your bench press or your leg press strength. However, uh, if you have some sort of health problem, as Jordan has talked about, heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, overweight, uh, overweight then you may need to do some conditioning. Uh, one of the nice things about weight training is that it does have a knock-on conditioning effect, as we have seen, okay? Like, you can get tired doing deadlifts, and there are people for whom actually are not in quite good enough condition to lift weights, right? And they may benefit from some conditioning. Further, as you become an intermediate trainee, Doing some conditioning probably isn't a bad idea. Uh, and what you choose to do is going to be based upon your goals and what you want. Like if uh, Jordan talks about, uh, what is it, eight metabolic units, okay? If you, if you can walk up... Metabolic equivalents. Metabolic equivalents. Uh, if you can walk up four flights of stairs without becoming wildly out of breath, you are about as conditioned as you need to be from a health standpoint. Uh, yeah, you're like, that's uh, a low bar. Yeah, well, but that's kind of, but that's the point, I'm right? Old, that's a very low bar. I can run you, you would be, you would be surprised at how many people yeah. can't do that. Yeah, that's yeah. you're you train, so uh, you're about to be a national record holder. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you know, um, I ha I have a trainee who competes in the IPF. She competes in IPF Worlds. And I have her do a little bit of stationary biking for reasons that have nothing to do with her powerlifting training, and she's fine. Even and I have her doing an awful lot of volume with lifting weights. Like she she lifts an awful lot of weights. Uh, how you want to do that is up to you. There's I know both Jordan and I have had people do intervals, like power intervals. Uh, we've had people do steady state stuff. I would guess that you probably are gravitating more towards low intensity steady state stuff for a lot of a lot of people um, yeah it's yeah i mean well it goes back to the stress thing right so if in lifting weights you want to get better at stuff you're trying to apply the correct stress so that you get the the adaptation right it is easy to go overboard easier to go overboard with the high intensity interval training if you're doing it for real like you you can really fatigue yourself with the prowler 
Yeah. Not to no, not to nocebo anybody and say, oh, the prowler is fatiguing, but that's yeah, it can it can do that, especially compared to like sitting on a bike and riding it for twenty five to thirty minutes with your heart rate at you know sixty to seventy percent of your um, of your max. The my gestalt uh, as far as what people should do is should if you're not doing any steady state at all, you should, that's where you should start because weight training is effectively high intensity interval training on steroids. It's the most anaerobic stuff. Literally, li literally, it's the most an anaerobic stuff you can do, right? So, so if you were like uh, a r endurance athlete, right? And this is high intensity interval training, effectively for you, and so you you know you may decrease volume of actual other interval training that's anaerobic because you're now you're doing strength strength training. So yeah, for people who need to lose weight, who have a, a med medical condition, or are involved in it, uh, or need cardio for some other reason that's not sport specific, I would probably have them start at low intensity, steady state, less than thirty minutes, less than three times a week. That's kind of the upper limit before it starts to really bleed into strength development. And if you play a sport where you get paid money, or you get famous, or you can win the affection of someone that you desire to win the affection of, then you have to practice that sport, and it it usually will develop your conditioning to a level that's compatible with that sport. So if you're a runner, you got to run. If you're a cyclist, you got to cycle. If you're a swimmer, you got to swim. Getting stronger without practicing your sport will make you stronger, but no better at your sport until you get back to practicing. Does that make sense? Okay. We were almost succinct there. Almost. That's pretty good. Um, can you just give some advice around rest, amount of rest you should do between... I know it's like based more on an individual, but like for example, I'm very time poor. I'm often trained when my kids are sleeping. Time sense. poor. So okay. I'm like aware of the time, and I think how much I rest definitely impacts then on what I'm capable of. So do you just have some advice around? Sure. You can use early, early on, you can. It's it's not super stressful. Yeah. So three minutes is fine. And further, you can warm stuff up. Like, as you're doing your work sets or squats, you can warm up your press or your bench press so that when you're done with squats, you need just a couple of minutes and you can go into work sets. So that's a way to compress the time of your workout. As it gets heavier, you may need a little more rest. Uh, and depending upon kind of what your goals are, you can rest quite a bit between sets, uh, especially as you kind of go to the end of your novice linear progression. Um, as an intermediate, you'll probably cut down the amount of rest time a little bit as a way of one, making your workout shorter, and two, it's a way of actually kind of, you know, almost increasing the stress you're yeah. giving yourself. With less with less yeah. weight on the bar, less, you know, yeah. It makes it harder, right? When you rest less. Uh, that being said, if you didn't have anyone tell you that shorter rest periods were bad, then they may not have as significant an effect on you as they do currently. Yes. So, internet. I am unconvinced that taking short rest, shorter rest periods that are within an acceptable range, for instance, this four to five minute range, right, are compromised training outcomes compared to what I would consider excessively long rest times, like six to eight minutes which are incompatible with life and work and work capacity development that ultimately leads to that you need to develop for future training. So I would very rarely recommend six to eight minute rest periods outside of the following exceptions. One, you go going to a meet and you're doing very, very heavy singles. And so you just may need that time to mentally work up enough chutzpah to go lift. Uh, if you have COPD, if you have Exercise Define induced COPD. Yeah, so chronic uh, obstructive pulmonary disease that is, you actually are having problems catching your breath, and you know, or if you have like exercise induced asthma or some some other issue that's literally stretching out your rest periods. Otherwise, just take weight off the bar. I know blasphemous, but the deal is so. So let's say you had an hour to train. Okay, you have three exercises to do, and there was no way that you're going to do the sets. Uh, at the, you know, across with three-minute rest periods and that's all you can handle. Well, you just take weight off the bar. 
do the first set at the normal weight, take 10% off, rest three minutes, do it again. That seemed reasonable. Rest three minutes and do it again. You may find some nice range where you can do a top set and then back off sets. Don't let perfect be the enemy of good in the situation. Uh, later on, when you need more training, more stress, you're going to have to train more days per week. And, you, you know, again, that functions better with the shorter rest period. So my rest periods now when I'm in a volume, uh, like block or whatever, three to four minutes tops. Because the weights are sub-maximal. I'm not, my set of, my set of five, for instance, I could have done for a set of seven or eight. So it's not like, okay, this is, I have to summon, you know, everything and, and, and turn it up to 11 to do this set. I find that generally that type of training is not productive after a certain period of time. Uh, just before I did with lifting, I also used to do yoga and swimming. So my question is, um, when I'm starting training now, um, officially, like, can I still do the exercise I used to do? Or like, what's the recommended frequency I should do? The uh, well, uh, as an untrained person, you're becoming more trained. But as an untrained person right now you are tapping into training and both training and recovery resources doing other physical activity. That being said, if you had been doing this previously, high level or very often such that you never got sore or tired when you went to yoga, you never got sore or tired when you did swimming, it's not a big deal because you were so adapted to the stress, then maybe it's not a big deal. But I find that most people who do yoga recreationally do yoga recreationally and are not necessarily training their yoga to a high level. Does that kind of make sense? So it's still pretty stressful to them on some level, which is why you'll see studies suggesting that yoga improves strength in untrained people because it's more than they're nor normally doing. Um, so my recommendation for someone like you would be just give me three months. Just give me three months where you, you stay out of the yoga studio, you can collect the Lululemon for when you go back on week four or on month four, and then um, I would reintroduce it when you're no longer a novice, because effectively at that point you've been training for a longer period of time. You're more adapted to this. You kind of know what you need to do uh, better in the gym, and you can slowly start to increase what you're doing outside of the gym. That's what I would do, unless unless it made your life significantly better, better and worth living to do the yoga the, the seriously if that's your entire social circle and you have no you know i don't want you to get depressed and just just to lift weights it's not worth it you know um i've heard you deliver this before on a podcast but just give us your list of supplements that you think are worth us spending our money on oh sure yeah so i mean cocaine. what's that cocaine cocaine yeah that's great <laughs> no um so definitely so whey protein which people want to quibble whether or not it's a supplement but it's great uh creatine monohydrate uh, beta alanine, betaine anhydrous, which is also known as trimethylglycerin. Uh, HMB is pretty good. Uh, citrulline malate is useful. Sodium chloride, which is just salt, can be useful. Um, I, there's a whole sticky, like a, a list, and like why and what and how, which is actually on the startingstrength.com website that Tom stickied in the nutrition forum. Now, did you get taken down? My sticky's no longer up. It's still a it's still a thread. It's been unsticky though. Oh, so it's gonna move down. Yeah. All right. So check this out. You have now motivated me to copy and paste that onto the website oralmedicine.com. But those are the supplements, and I'll post that on the website. It's also those all the supplements are also in my supplement, which is used to be known as Gains RX with three Z's, and now it's Perry RX because well, so here's the deal. Look. Like, I, I get that I'm a little bro, you know, I got a tank top on, whatever, it's fine. Uh, bros have no problem being like, yeah, I'm taking gains, it's awesome. But, you know, if I want to appeal to the masses, I need you know, something a little more palatable, so I switch it to Perry. So, it's available on Amazon, on my website. The ingredients, you can source one by one from multiple supplement companies, and it's cheaper than me shipping it to Australia. So, I'm happy to send it to you, you know, but... Uh, yeah, if you look at the ingredients and the dosages there, that would be an easy way to copy. Just don't start your own supplement with my same ingredients. Is there a, say you've got an old, much older person who's training out who's been training for a long time. So, is there like a reverse LP? Do they gracefully get weak during the night or they just like one day get full and half my spot? It's a linear regression, right? <laughs> ending, ending strength, you just take five pounds off. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think what happens is you, there are multiple contributors to 
maintain, maintaining the necessary stress recovery adaptation cycle that you need to improve strength. And then at that point, a regression start to occur. And as far as how rapid that is, depends on a bunch of other stuff, you know. I don't know what age that occurs. It's like it's very individualized for people and also uh, complicated by their motivation to continue to like, you know, spend a significant portion of their life here. Um, but, you know, that being said, 2013, Orlando, Florida, David Ricks shows up. I was going to ask how old David Ricks is. David Ricks was 53 at this time, okay? And uh, I remember I prepped for this meeting. I thought I was doing pretty well. I'm like, all right, podium, we're going to go. You know, it's going to be great. And this guy is walking around in like, a 15-year-old Titan singlet. I'm like, what the hell? And his shoes have been out of production for 25 years. And I'm like, Pfft. and he smells like menthol, like Ben Gay. Like he's like he took a bath in liniment, you know? And I'm like, this guy's masters, no reason to worry about him, right? He has the heaviest opening squat out of all of us in our weight class. He squatted 10 kilos above the then world record, and he squatted it so fast, the barbell jumped off of his back. Like, literally, in the air. And he missed it the first time. Had to take a step. All right, anyway, he ended up crushing all of us by about 30, 40 kilos that day. Like, just crushed it. He pulled. So he ended up squatting uh, 640-something. So, uh, yeah, 295 kilos. And then bent 200 and uh, pulled 340-something. Right, 53. What, what body weight? 93 kilo body weight. Then, right, so this is 2013. Now, last year, he did set the IPF world record for the 93 kilo weight class. 710, so that's what, 335 or something like that. In, here's the worst part, dad shoes, grandpa shoes, the white Nike, like monarchs. Like, it's crazy. Uh, anyway, I'm and obsessed. He's, he's now 58? 58, yeah. Yeah, so maybe never, but sometime. Yeah, it makes me upset with myself, just as a human, really. <laughs> so I have to, like, lie to myself and say, oh, well, he's not a doctor, you know, and uh, <laughs> he's probably never had a beard. And, uh, and there, are, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of older trainees, people in their 60s and 70s, who haven't trained in their yeah. lives, and they Sorry. wind up exceeding their levels of strength as much younger people. Yep. I, had a, I had a guy who, on his... 69th birthday, squatted 295 pounds. Uh, and then he went for 300, and he missed it that high. Sorry, Michael. And uh, I wouldn't give it to him. You said, no, no, no. I mean, you know, this, this poor guy is turning 69, and I was, you know, 35 at the time, and I'm telling him, no. But you can, you can get really strong. He was, a, he was a, not a, a big dude. He was probably, you know... 85 kilos, something, yeah. something like that. So what you can do as an older person has not really been explored or appreciated yep. uh, as far as strength. Thankfully, yes. as we both age second by second. Yep. All right, so that's a wrap on our Q&A from Sydney, Australia. Again, that was February of this year. Tom Campitelli and I were down there. Hope you guys liked it. If you haven't been over to iTunes yet to leave us a review, please do that so that way more people are checking out our stuff. Also, for all the latest and greatest content, head over to the barbellmedicine.com website. Sign up for our newsletter. Thanks, as always, for tuning in. We'll catch you guys next time.